Good evening and welcome to the Bible study of the Abundant Love Church. I am Pastor Gary Bush. Delighted that you've taken this time uh, this Wednesday evening uh, to hear a word from the Lord. We're here uh, to study the word of the Lord because we don't live by bread alone, but we live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so we invite you tonight uh, to worship with us and to take part in our study. Uh, we'll sing a song, have a word of prayer, uh, a few announcements, maybe sing another song, and then we'll go into our study. The song says, with my hands lifted up and my mouth filled with praise. With my hands lifted up and my mouth filled with praise. With the heart opportunity to come together. We thank you uh, because we're able to come and to open and to share your word. We thank you for the privilege that you've given us to be partakers in the word of God. And so, Father, we certainly thank you for this day, all the activities of this day, all the travels of this day, all the opportunities that this day has presented that we have benefited from, taken advantage of. We thank you for your protection through this day for your endless and boundless love that you have expressed towards us. Thank you because great is your faithfulness. We find new mercies every morning. And so we declare your greatness among the people. We exalt you and call you God of gods. There is none like you. There is none beside you. You are God alone. And we bless you tonight. Thank you, Father for this opportunity to share your word. I pray that your anointing would be in your word and let every hearer be blessed. And so God, strengthen us and help us tonight. We dare not end this prayer without praying for our nation. Pray, oh God, that you would let calmer heads, holy hearts, lead us through this very traumatic time. I pray that the voice of the Lord would not only be sounded, but that hearts would be turned that we would hear and heed what thus saith the Lord. We pray for our sitting president. We pray, Father, for the president-elect. We pray uh, continued smooth transition as the administrations change. Uh, we pray that you would rebuke the spirit of violence that's trying to loose itself in our nation. I pray 
that you would speak peace to this storm just like you spoke it uh, on the sea with the disciples. Then, Father, most of all, those that are suffering from the pandemic, I pray that you would stretch out your hand. Let the healing God, Jehovah Rapha, intercede for us. And then, God, we trust you and we believe you and we stand on your word. Now, bless our worship and bless our Bible study this evening. Let everything be said and everything be done to your will and to your glory. We ask it in the matchless, the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. All right, just a few announcements here tonight so we can get started. I um, want to encourage you, as always, support your local church. Uh, be a supporter, be a participator, uh, whether it be in person with social distance and masking or whether it be by virtual means. Whatever it is, you want to make sure uh, that you stay unified and stay connected with the body. I want to encourage you to pray for your pastor. Pray for your church officials so that the work of the ministry uh, doesn't suffer and so that the work of the Lord can go forward. I um, want you to support financially. Uh, be a tither, not a tipper. Be a tither. Tithe 10% of your income and prove the Lord. If he won't open the windows of heaven, pour you out a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive. And then you want to give a generous offering. Uh, I heard you just then. You said, Pastor, you know, things are kind of tight now. My job is cut back. Um, you know, I don't get as many hours and I don't get as much money. And so I'm really just trying to hold things together. And I don't think I have enough to give. Well, just let me encourage you this. Uh, that widow that the prophet Elisha found when he went over to Zarephath, she said that she was gathering her last uh, sticks so that she could make her last meal for her and her son. She said she was going to eat it and die. And the man of God said, you know, don't stop what you're doing, but make a small cake for me first. And in obedience, she did. And the Bible says that the meal barrel and the oil did not fail until the famine was over. So uh, don't ask me how it's done. Uh, some people say, well, God filled up the meal barrel. I, I don't believe that. I, I believe that every time she went back to the meal barrel, there was a handful in there. And so however he did it, she was able to get through that famine and she was able to take care of her child. So even this famine, this tough time now, uh, don't just put all your trust in the job. Put your trust in God. And certainly the Lord will provide because he promised. And God is not a promise breaker. God is a promise keeper. So be a tither, uh, be a giver, and let the Lord open avenues and make ways to bless you. Amen? Amen. All right. Uh, certainly want to uh, remind you of our streams. Uh, we do stream twice on Sunday at 930 with the Sunday school lesson, the international Sunday school lesson. Then we have morning worship at 11. Then, of course, our last stream is here on Wednesday evening, 630. Uh, we sing a couple of songs and then we go into our Bible study. Um, you can find these streams uh, on the YouTube channel, AL Ministries. That's capital A, capital L Ministries. And you can also find them on the Abundant Love Facebook page. And so uh, they're, they're there for your viewing pl uh, pleasure and your viewing edification. Amen? Amen. Okay, and also I want to say this to you. Uh, if you would like to contribute to the Abundant Love Church, uh, there are a number of ways, but two primarily that you can do it. Uh, you can find us on the mobile app, Givelify. That is G-I. G-I-V-I-L-F-Y <laughs> Givelify under the Abundant Love Church and you can make a contribution that way or you can mail a contribution to P.O. Box 6577 Fort Wayne, Indiana and that zip code is 46896 and so certainly we do appreciate your support appreciate your contribution uh, in helping us to continue the work of the Lord in this part of the vineyard. Amen. Uh, also, the last thing about uh, streams is that every Monday morning, we put out a two-minute video clip entitled Motivating Moments. You can also find that 
on the YouTube channel and on the Facebook page of Abundant Love. Uh, take a look at it, and if it blesses you, uh, you know, drop us a word and let us know that you appreciate it. Amen? Amen. All right. I have one correction before we go into this next song, and the correction is this. Um, we posted a, a copy of our 21-day consecration. And that 21 consecrate, the 21 day consecration basically removes uh, dietary items so that the last seven days we are um, basically keeping the Daniel fast, which is pulse and water, which is vegetables, anything grown from the ground and water. But there is a correction on the second week. The first week it says to remove the red meat and the sweets the, and, and the pork. The second week it says remove chicken and fish. It should not be chicken and fish. It should be chicken and turkey. You remove poultry the second week, which means that second week you can still have fish. So next week you can still have fish. And then the last week uh, we'll remove the fish and we'll be on actually uh, what's considered the Daniel fast. Uh, we'll, we will post uh, those corrections on the Abundant Love Facebook page because uh, we just want to be clear about this. Amen? Amen. Okay. All right. Keep those announcements in mind. We're going to sing one more song, and he's a mighty God. I'm glad for our musician tonight. Ebony Dupree is with us tonight, and then our drummer is Master Grayson Bush. He's on the drums tonight, five years old, and he's helping us, and we're appreciative of his help tonight. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. The angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore. you've taken this opportunity to tune in tonight and we've been working uh, from a theme this month. We are a church and a ministry that works by themes and so once we set a theme for the month we kind of uh, continue to expound that theme until the end of the month so that we are sure that when we get to the end of the month we have a thorough understanding of the word concerning that theme and here 
to start the month, or rather the month of January and the year of 2021. Uh, we have a one word theme. It is, a, uh, it is the theme is focus. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to do tonight. That's the second time I've had a little slip here tonight. So let me, let me zero in here now. Uh, our theme for the month of January is focus. And uh, we found that theme with a number of scriptures. But here for these few weeks, we've been dealing with the book of Philippians, the third chapter, verse number 12, 13, and 14. That's Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, the third chapter. Verse number 12, 13, and 14. And I'll read it here from the King James Version. It says, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Yeah. Verse number 13 says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, verse number 14 says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. May the Lord bless his word. And we've been talking about focus and uh, my encouragement has been, if you are focused, uh, you want to remain focused. And if perchance um, you got a little distracted, maybe a little off course, uh, we are uh, encouraging you to regain your focus. Certainly uh, not just uh, the year of 2020, but here in the early portion of 2021, uh, there are many distractions I mean, just numerous uh, things that can take your focus and take your attention. And not that they're not important things, because anytime loss of life is involved, it is very, very important. But there is something more important than loss of life. And that's loss of soul and eternal life. So eternal life is always a higher plane than natural life. Um, and we must keep it in perspective uh, with the uh, events of 2020 and this pandemic that just um, seems to be relentless in, in affecting families uh, with the political drama that's uh, happening now. Uh, there's a new story and a new headline almost every day. So there is many vying Many things vying for your attention, trying to take uh, your focus. And so uh, despite the distractions and, and things that can come to take your attention, we want to be sure to focus and stay concentrated on the things of God. And so tonight uh, here briefly, I want to talk to you about separation to expectation, separation to expectation. And so our introduction uh, tonight says, if we're going to be successful in 2021, we must define and identify our goals of success. And we're talking about goals. We're not just talking about personal goals in regards to, uh, you know, losing weight and uh, things of that nature. But we're talking about spiritual goals, things that we want to do things that the Lord has placed before us and things that we want to accomplish to glorify his name. So uh, I'm not saying it's wrong to have natural goals. You should have, uh, but you should have spiritual goals. You should have things uh, that you want to accomplish in the name of Christ. Uh, I have to remind um, um, our, our congregation because every January we go through this dietary uh, consecration and if you follow the consecration, uh, you're going to lose some pounds. Uh, in fact, I'm losing a few already myself. But the goal is not to lose pounds. That's a good collateral uh, byproduct. But that's not the goal. The goal is to silence the voice and the desire of the flesh so that we can hear what the spirit is saying. Uh, Paul said that when I'm weak, that is naturally carnally, then am I strong 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said that my strength is made perfect in weakness, and that is in your weakness. So we find a correlation between the natural man and the spirit man. Spirit man uh, is the one that's supposed to dominate and lead because the natural man, according to the scripture, is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. It, so that it's not possible for people who are in the flesh to please God. So we have to get out of the flesh uh, hear what the spirit is saying to the church so that we can obey the Lord and please the Lord. And so we got to identify, define and identify spiritual goals, not just ones that we set. We have to try to hear the voice of the spirit and see what the spirit is saying to us, because as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And so God will lead you to what type of spiritual goals you should have for this year. And so once you have located those goals, once you've identified those goals and defined those goals, uh, you have to concentrate and focus on those goals. You have to uh, kind of put it in the crosshairs. You have to make sure that it's the center of your effort and the center of your attention. And then once you've identified the goal, once you focus and, you know, zeroed in on the goal that you want, then you have to vigorously pursue it. You have to go after it. It's not uh, success is moving. It's never in one place. So you just have to kind of see which way success is for you and you have to move in that direction. Uh, I've been taught uh, that there's the law of first occurrence and it is the first time something is mentioned in the Bible. That is normally usually what you will find it doing throughout uh, the entire Bible. The first time you hear about the Spirit of God, it is moving upon the face of the waters. And so the, the Spirit of God is not stagnant. It's not in one place. It is a moving spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, and it moves for progress. It moves from place to place. And our job is to discern which way the Lord is moving and move yeah. with him. And so uh, we have to pursue, we pursue the Spirit of the Lord. And we pursue that spirit right to the goals that the Lord has set for us. And then, uh, certainly last but not least, once we get focused and we start pursuing, we have to remain focused. We got to stay focused in our pursuit despite opposition and despite uh, distractions that will arise as you attempt to do the will of the Lord. Uh, the Bible says that when I would do good, evil is always present. So anytime you desire to do a good thing, you're going to have some hindrances. You're going to have some opposition. You're going to have something to stand up in your way, try to stop you uh, from doing uh, what it is you are supposed to do. But Jesus said, be of good cheer. He said, I've overcome the world. And because I have overcome, you can overcome also. And so... To focus, it means that we must concentrate and devote all of our attention and all of our efforts toward that set and desired goal. Many times, the challenge as we pursue that goal is to remain focused, to stay focused, because opposition and opponents and distractions are constantly vying for our attention. But to be success, successful in the achievement of our goals, we must successfully focus, we must successfully pursue, and we must be effective in separating and distancing ourselves from worldly influence and things that will detour us from the goal and uh, while separating ourselves from those worldly influence, we must maintain high expectations in accordance with God's word. And with a view of the things that God said we uh, can expect, we can have that high expectation and the, that expectation can serve as motivation for us to overcome and to achieve. So this evening we're going to deal with a little bit tonight. We're going to examine the importance of separation from negative things and the expectation of better things. God calls us to be separated from some things and the separation from certain things sets you in an ideal place 
for expectation of greater things to come. So uh, we want to deal uh, briefly tonight with separation to expectation. Now, I want to remind you again of the four definitions of focus. Two of them are nouns, two of them are verbs, and I'll deal with a couple of them tonight. Focus number one is the center of interest and activity. So you focus, when you focus on something, whatever is the heart and the core of what you focus on or, or give your attention and efforts to, that's what it means to focus on that. In other words, you have to have an object of your focus. Number two, focus is the state of quality of producing clear visual definition. So it means you not only see it, but you see the intricate detail of it so that you can see it clearly. Number three, focus means to adapt to the available light so that it becomes freely. And I use the example of going from a, a, a very bright room to a room that is not so dark. Uh, it takes a period of time for your eyes to adjust so they can discern what's in the darker room. Um, the pupils work by the amount of light that's available. And so they open and contract depending on how much light is available. So when you go from one uh, degree of light to another degree of light, it takes the eye a period of time to adjust so that it can see uh, in the next uh, room with the different light level. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I equate that with discernment. Sometimes you get into situations and before you can move off, you got to discern what the Lord is saying, what the Lord is doing before you take off in a direction. And then certainly number four, uh, focus is to pay particular attention to a thing. And I want to say special attention. See, because in the course of a day, we have to do many things. But uh, some days are filled with events that we cannot afford uh, in other words, they're so important that they have to be done that day. And when something is so important that it has to be done that day, uh, you want to pay particular attention to it. You want to make sure that it doesn't get undone. And so you do uh, extra things to remind you so that you don't uh, let that thing be undone. Um, I, I, uh, a few, few uh, I want to say years ago now, um, it became necessary for me to drink more water. And at that time, uh, I wasn't drinking a lot of water. And so I downloaded an app. And this app would remind me every hour on the hour to drink water because that's how important it was to me. I did something extra to make sure I was reminded so that I didn't leave what I needed to do undone. And sometimes you have to do the same thing when it comes to the work of the Lord. You got to set some routines in place so that you get reminders and it keeps uh, keeps it fresh in front of you so you can make sure that the most important thing gets done. I'll tell you a few things that you really, uh, you run the risk of ruining your day if you go without praying and without seeking God's word and what he has to say about the day. According to the model prayer that Jesus gave us, uh, we're to pray, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. There's a daily bread for us. So it's kind of dangerous to be going through the day without your daily bread. Uh, you won't have the strength, won't have the sustenance that you need for that particular day. And then uh, uh, St. Luke 18 and 1 said he spoke a parable to this end that men ought always pray. So you can't always be on your knees, but you can be in an attitude of prayer, trying to hear what God is saying in every situation that you come upon. And so uh, that's what focus is. It's the center of your attention. It's to see it clearly. It's to be able to discern uh, what kind of things are going on around it. And it means that you've made it a priority and you're paying particular attention to it. And so the challenge comes once that we have set our focus on the goal or the, the goal that God has set before us is that the enemy will put things in our way to try to discourage us from getting to the destination. It's been my experience that, that uh, hindrances come in three particular ways. Either you will have an opponent or you will have a distraction, an obstacle placed in your way, or or 
you will <laughs> you, you'll have an opponent, you have a distraction, or you'll have a hindrance. Okay. So an opponent is someone who stands up in your way. An obstacle is an object in your way, and a hindrance is something attached to you to slow you down, slow your progress, stop your progress. And so the things uh, that will pop up um, when you get ready uh, to do the work of the Lord, uh, there are things that are trying to stop you, detour you, slow you down uh, so that you don't get there in the timely fashion that the Lord has designed for you. And so uh, the first definition says focus is to keep it the center of attention. And um, as the center of activity it means to keep it as the center, and sometimes to keep it as the center, you have to keep it distinct and unmixed from other things. Now, um, I am one of those people, uh, there are just certain things when I'm eating, I can't allow them to run together. Now, I love food, and when they get together, they're gonna get together in my stomach. But on my plate, uh, there are certain there are certain foods that you just can't allow uh, to let, allow them to run together. Now, now I, I, I really, I'm talking about food and we're on a consecration, but I think this will make the point. Okay, I don't have a problem with cornbread uh, when I'm eating greens, them getting wet. I don't have a problem, you know, crumble them up and, and, and eat it like that. But if I'm not eating greens, uh, I don't want my cornbread wet uh, with some other juice of some other food on the plate. I want to keep it distinct. I want to keep it uh, to itself so that when I eat it, I get only the taste of the cornbread and not something that is uh, kind of influencing the taste of the cornbread. Now that's a very crude example, but many times if you don't keep God's business unmixed from other things, God's business can start to take the flavor of other things that you have uh, kind of associated with. Oh, Pastor, you're probably going to get in a little trouble today, but I don't mind. Um, one of the things that we have to be very cautious of as we serve the Lord now are the influences of the world into the church. Um, yes, dancing is okay. But there's a difference in a holy dance and a seductive dance. Yeah. Okay. Herodias' daughter did a seductive dance. Okay. That's not the kind of dance we want going on in the house of the Lord. Mm -hmm. We want a holy dance, one that glorifies God, like, like Miriam did, grabbed the tambourine and they, uh, you know, sang a song and did a dance to the victory. So uh, we have to be careful so that the influences of the world don't come in and influence what the church is doing. There's, there's got to be a difference uh, between clean and unclean, between holy and unholy. And so uh, we have to segregate. We got to separate the things of God. Now, pastor, why do we have to separate the things of God? Because Amos 3 and 3 says, can two walk together except they be agreed. So for something to go along with, go, with God's program and God's plan, it has to find agreement with the word of God. And if it finds agreement with the word of God, then that's something that we can take along with us. But if something breaks the principles and the truths and the morality of the word of God, uh, those are not the kind of things uh, that we can travel with. We can only walk with people and we can only walk with things. And when I say walk with them, I mean in terms of fellowship and communion. Uh, that doesn't mean you don't speak to sinners and you don't interact with them, but your primary interaction with sinners should be to show them the goodness of the Lord and the love of Jesus. But, you know, just running around with them just for the sake of running around with them, uh, the Bible says, what agreement has the temple of God with the temple of Belial? What, what agreement has holy things 
with unholy things. There, there should be no place of commonality when it comes to unholy things and holy things. And so um, we want to be separated for, from certain things. And this is always kind of, you know, a point of contention because we've had people kick and cry so much about the legalism of the church that now, you know, they almost believe they can do anything and still be a Christian. But uh, a close examination of the church will reveal something that the older saints used to say to us all the time. And they said it to us and they explained it to us so that we understood it. They said to us, don't be worldly. Don't be like the world is what they said to us. And so if they seen us partaking in something that was real popular in the world, they discouraged it because they said that the world's order was contrary to God's order and that we shouldn't take part in the world order uh, in certain areas and in certain ways. And um, there's some truth to it. And separation is it is the action and the state of moving and remaining apart and so to be with Christ it is absolutely necessary that we separate from some things in the world my pastor Bishop John Dupree said if you can do everything after you get saved that you could do before you got saved uh, then what did you get saved from Okay, we are saved from sin and we are saved from the actions of sin and the influences of sin. Paul said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Some old things have to pass. You have to separate from some old things. And uh, John said it like this in 1 John, the second chapter, verses 15, 16. And 17, it reads like this. It says, and this is encouragement to the saints of God. Uh, it says, love not the world. Okay, we live in the world, but we are not of the world. We don't own and buy into all the world systems because we are citizens of another kingdom. And so we are not to love the world, neither the things that are in the world. And, and this is, uh, this qualifier is so tight uh, that you really can't really, I mean, you can't really fuss back at this. It says, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And what he is saying that it is impossible to love the world and to love the Father. Impossible to love the world and love Christ at the same time. Matthew said that you can't serve two masters. You're going to hold to one, love, love one, hate the other, hold to one, despise the other. You cannot love two. You have to make a decision. And when it comes to God, it's either the way, the ways of the Lord or the ways of the world. Okay. What do you mean the kingdom? The kingdom is, is God's ways of doing things. And God does things direly different than the world does. And you have to choose and you have to side with the way God does things. And you cannot embrace the way the world does things. We're not to love the world. We're not to love the things that are in the world. Because if we love the world, the love of the Father is not in us. And then it gives us some definition uh, about what it means uh, to love the world. It says in verse 16, for all that is in the world is the desire of the flesh, that's lust, that's what that lust means, the desire or lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And so what you see moving uh, in the world today, uh, you see people going after fleshly desires, uh, things they can taste, Things that they can touch, things they can hear, see and smell. Uh, there, there is more to life than satisfying the desires of your flesh. Uh, the lust of the eyes. Um, my father used to say to us, uh, sometimes we would get home and there was a, you know, a great meal on the table. 
and we would fill our plate, you know, just pile it up. Uh, and then uh, we couldn't eat all that we piled on the plate. We want to uh, throw it away. And my father would say to us, he said, your eyes overloaded your stomach. And what he was saying is that that desire of the eyes to have it all uh, actually grabbed more than uh, we really needed. And you see people in businesses like that in the world today. Uh, it's never enough. Amen. They're always seeking, always stretching, always reaching, never uh, settling at a place of gratification and satisfaction. And so that's all that's in the world. He summed it up in three areas of desire and everything that's contrary to the word of God can be found in one of these places. Either it's a lust of the flesh, something not to glorify God, but something to fulfill your own personal desire. It's the lust of the eyes and that's kind of, you know, that's kind of the lead into pride because many times we see something and when you see something, uh, sometimes you have the tendency to covet and to want to go after it. And then the pride of life. And this pride is not arrogance. This pride is I am self-sufficient. I don't need anybody else to help me. It's the fool full of pride that said in his heart, there is no God. And if there's no God, then I don't need a God to serve. I don't need a God to take care of me. And I become my own master, master of my own universe. And that new age stuff is just as crazy as it can be because this is not your universe. You had nothing to do with making it. You better be glad you're here. And one day you're going to leave it and you're going to have to meet a God. And, and we can only meet that God when it comes to having a relationship with his son, Jesus. So all that's in the world, this is all, I mean, you can sum it up. All, all you'll find in the world is the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And then it's redundant. It said, it's not of the father, but it's of the world. So there's a difference between the things of God and the things of the world. And so we have to choose uh, the things of God. And then Verse number 17 really kind of puts it into full perspective. It says, this world and the world passes away. This world is not going to stand forever. People believe that the world will go on and on and on and on. It is contrary to God's word. This present system in the earth is not going to last forever. There's an end. God has determined the end for it. This world is going to pass away and the lust thereof. So anything that you desire that's apart from God, it's going to pass away. It doesn't last forever. And then that verse ends and finishes by saying but he that does the will of God abides forever. And the reason you abide forever because if you do God's will down here, when your life is over down here, you're going to live eternally with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you have to separate. The Bible says, uh, come from among them and be separate, said the Lord. He said, I'll receive you. Uh, touch not, taste not, handle not the unclean thing. There are certain things that as a Christian, you have to separate yourself from worldly things that they promote as a way of life, we can't accept as a way of life because certain ways of the world promote idol gods. And we're not to have idol gods. We're not to have any God before the Lord God. And so uh, we have to separate. There are things uh, that when we get saved, uh, we have to separate from. We have to distance ourselves. Okay. We have to... Uh, socially distance ourselves from some areas and some places that uh, encourage us and tempt us to sin. Okay, um, We have to, uh, the Bible promises a crown to people that overcome temptation. And so the, the old song that we used to sing said, yield not to temptation because yielding is sin. And that in and of itself says, that there are certain things we have to stay away from so that we don't sin. And so when we identify something as sin and when, that we, and when we know something is sinful, we have to separate from that thing. The Bible says abstain, stay away from the very appearance of evil. Two schools of thought. 
uh, either it looks evil or it appears manifest as evil. Either way, if it looks bad, if it's against God's uh, word, uh, you want to take steps back from it. You don't want to be associated with things that will cause you not to be able to do what God has designed you to do. And so you have to separate. There has to be a separation from some things so that you can give God the glory uh, that he deserves. But it's like any habit that you've had that you are moving away from. Many times breaking habits are not successful because they don't have something to replace the habit that they had. And so you not only have to step away from certain things, take your focus off of certain things, but you have to put your focus on other things to be successful with the thing you've gotten away from. And I, I think that's kind of what Paul said in the 13th verse. He says, I haven't apprehended. He said, but this one thing I do, here's what I do. I forget those things that are behind me. I separate from those things that are behind me then he says, I reach forth unto those things that are before. In other words, now I'm reaching with another expectation. I'm reaching with a new expectation. Now that I've turned loose what I've had hold of, but now I'm looking not for what I had. I'm looking now, I'm looking forward to new expectations. And time really will not permit me to mention everything that we have to look forward to as we come into Christ. But I'll mention just a couple here tonight uh, as we uh, close with our time here tonight. When we look forward to what the Lord gives us, we should look for, forward to life eternal with him. Uh, John 3.16 says, you know it, for God so, that's right, love the world that he gave his that's right, only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. One of the things we have to look forward is living in eternity in the presence of God. The second death is separation from the presence of God. But when we receive Jesus Christ, he said, no man can come to the Father but by me. But in Jesus Christ, I not only went away, I went away to prepare a place for you that where I am, you can be there also. And so we can look forward to living eternally with Jesus Christ. And then we always quote 16, but John 3, 17 just redundantly tells us why Jesus was sent into the world. The Bible says in John 3, 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus came to save. And in that salvation, there's so many things that are offered to us. We get righteousness. We get justification. We get extended mercy. We get sanctification. We get consecration. We get adopted into the family of God. And I can go on and on and on and on and on. And the Bible uh, just kind of summed it up when it says, if we are heirs, then we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ, which means we're entitled to share in the inheritance that God has for Jesus Christ because we are the bride of Christ. And so that's good for the next life. Amen. We expect God to do things. You know, the old preacher used to always preach, uh, the wicked shall cease from troubling and the weary shall be at rest. All the saints of the age are going to sit at his feet and be blessed. My pastor used to say, when you get to heaven, everything is on the house. God going to take care of everything. And then he would say, no more doctor bills, no more white bills and water bills. And, and, and that is true because we don't, the former things the Bible says are going to be passed away. But I want you to understand something. Serving Christ is not just beneficial in the life to come. It's beneficial in this life right now. Uh, the disciples asked Jesus, said, we've left everything to follow you. He said, what are we going to have? He said that no man who left, mother, father, sister, brother, family, that shall not re uh, receive eternal life. And in this life, 
he's going to receive blessings and promises. So there's some, you know, there's some good things that God has planned to give us on this side. And then he said to them, you guys are going to sit with me judging the 12 tribes uh, in, in, the, in the regeneration. But what I want you to understand, if we in this life have only hope in Christ, we're of all men most miserable. There's another life to come, but some of the blessings of God are for this present time. I think it's St. John 10 and 10 where he uh, uh, diametrically uh, uh, compares what the devil comes to do and what he comes to do. The Bible says in St. John 10 and 10 that the thief, that's the devil, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Every time the devil show up, he's trying to steal something from you that belongs to you. He's trying to kill something. That means he's trying to separate you from something that you're supposed to have in your life. And then he's trying to destroy it. Last of all, he wants you to turn your back on God and be destroyed with him in the lake of fire. He says about Job, he says, you got a hedge around Job. If you take that hedge from around him, I will make him curse you to your face. And that's all the enemy is trying to do to us. He's trying to overthrow our faith so that we don't have confidence in God to believe what God has said. And so that's all he comes for. Uh, he comes to steal, he comes to kill, and he comes to destroy. And that's pretty, you know, you know, he's a you know, he's always up to no good when he comes around. He's the author of confusion, all kind of trauma and drama. He's the father of lies and the originator of every evil work you can trace back uh, to the devil. But also in St. John 10 and 10, he told you why the thief came. And then Jesus told you why he came. He said, but I have come that you might have life, not just life, but life more abundantly. And so it is the plan of God to give you life in abundance. Abundant means, I love that word abundant. It means more than enough, more than is sufficient. And the, the truth of the matter is, God wants to give you all you can handle. See, God don't want to give you more than you can handle because if you get more than you have than you can handle you may forget the god that brought you solomon said don't give me too much lest you know lest i forget god don't give me too little lest i steal just give me enough so that i stay in a right relationship with god is the unspoken of what he said and so uh, in the parable of the talents, in the 25th chapter of St. Matthew, he gave one five, he gave one two, he gave one one, and then the Bible says he gave it to them according to their several abilities. He gave them what they could handle, and that's what the Lord wants to do to you. He wants to give you an abundance of good things, but he doesn't want to give you anything that's going to drive a wedge between you and him. He still wants you to love the giver more than the gift. Amen. So as long as the Lord is number one in our eyes, he'll give you all you can handle. Uh, yeah, I know some people take vows of poverty uh, when it comes uh, to serving the Lord. And I'm not knocking anybody. Uh, sometimes people make that sacrifice. Uh, but Abraham was rich. Isaac was rich. Um, Jacob was well to do. And so you see the people of God when they keep a right relationship with God, that God can bless them and then also get glory out of them. Um, and I'll close with this uh, in the book of Proverbs. It says, get wisdom, forget it not. It said, keep it as your sister. Uh, uh, in other words, make it a high priority because it says in one hand, it'll give you length of life. And then in the other hand, it'll give you durable riches. But the wisdom of it to know that the giver of the gift is greater than the gift. So God always wants us to love him more than what he gives us. Uh, we can take a page out of Job. Job after he lost everything. I, and I often wonder many times um, um, what we would do in that situation. Uh, Job had a whirlwind of things just occur at once. Okay. He lost his children. He lost his flocks. He lost his herds. I mean, I mean, he had he had multiple deaths. 
and went bankrupt all in the same day. And before one messenger could get done talking, another messenger was coming in uh, with bad news. I think I, with bad news. I think that gives uh, definition to the scripture that says when the enemy comes in like a flood. And when that flood came on Job that day, um, after hearing all that traumatic news, the Bible said that he rent his garment and fell on the floor not to cry. He fell on the floor to worship. He said the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. His concept, the wisdom is that as long as I have the giver, the things can go and come. And then we find later on in Job that the Lord rewarded him double for everything that he had lost. So wisdom says that we keep God in the right place and the right perspective. And I'll close with this because as I think about Job, um, God had Job's heart. And that's what the Lord wants from us because if he's got the earnest of your heart, um, the rest of you will follow. And sometimes our heart gets broken. And it's a challenge when you have to pick up the fragments of your heart before you present it to God. Sometimes, sometimes life can come at you with things that'll just break your heart. Uh, just, I mean, fracture it into pieces, leave you feeling devastated, lost and alone. But there is a God who's willing. Listen, all you got to do, just, just, just crawl around and grab the pieces. And bring all those pieces and offer those pieces up to God. And I guarantee you, he is a mender of broken hearts. He'll not only put your heart back together again, but he'll give you hope and a reason to go on. And so we want to separate from the things that keep us away from God. And then we want to have high expectation, high hope in the things of God. Amen? Yeah. Amen. All right. God bless you. That was our lesson for tonight going to have a word of prayer here and then we will be finished. Uh, Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word tonight and we thank you uh, for the wisdom to know that there are certain things that we must part from so that we can walk with you. Uh, would you uh, not let us be attracted to the glitz and the glamour of the world? Can we, like Jesus, after be shown uh, the glory of all the kingdoms of the world say that we will worship God and only him uh, will we serve. And we pray your blessings upon the people of God that we would not be distracted, uh, that we would be separated from any and everything that would cause us not to walk as your dear children. I pray for the church everywhere. I pray for every man of God that is preaching your word, and teaching the people of God how to follow after the Lord. I pray that this word that we taught tonight would go into the good ground of the heart, that it would bear fruit, much fruit, and let that fruit remain. We thank you for it and we bless you in the matchless and the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. All right, God bless you. Have a wonderful night tonight.